Hi everyone and welcome to Astronomy 1P01 at Brock University. I'm Professor Barak Shoshani and I will be your instructor for this course. So this first lecture is just going to be an introduction. We're going to learn some basic concepts in science and astronomy, get an overview of some of the fascinating things we'll learn about, and we'll also discuss scales, what are the smallest and largest things in the universe. So first of all, what is astronomy? Astronomy studies celestial objects, anything that exists outside of Earth. And this includes objects such as planets, moons, asteroids, comets, stars, black holes, galaxies, and the universe as a whole. Astronomy is a science, so to understand how astronomy works, we must first understand how science works. Science is not a body of knowledge. It's a method for obtaining and verifying knowledge about our universe. In science, we make observations and experiments and use them to create hypotheses that try to explain how things work. Scientific hypotheses have predictions, which need to be tested experimentally. If an experiment disagrees with the hypothesis, we need to modify or discard the hypothesis. But if enough experiments agree with the predictions of a hypothesis, then it eventually becomes an established theory. Now, it's important to understand Theory in everyday language means the same thing as hypothesis or speculation. But in science, theory means a hypothesis that was rigorously tested and verified. So a theory is an accurate explanation of how things work. Now, once a hypothesis becomes a theory, we can use it to understand the universe better, predict the results of future experiments or events, and create new technologies. These, by the way, are basically the three types of scientists, the theorists, the experimentalists, and the applied scientists or engineers. But it's always possible that other experiments in the future will contradict the theory, and then we need to find an even better theory. In this way, science is self-correcting and always moves forward. Our understanding of nature becomes better and more precise with each new theory. This process of creating hypotheses and then testing them is called the scientific method. One of the most important components of this method is skepticism. Scientists remain skeptical about any new hypothesis until there is enough evidence supporting it. Because of skepticism, the scientific method is the only reliable and trustworthy method of obtaining knowledge. Scientists don't trust theories based on belief or faith. We trust theories because we test them and find evidence for them. And it's very important to understand that no theory is sacred. If you find any evidence that contradicts a theory, then we don't trust it anymore and we try to find a better one. So, just so you know, anything you learn in this course might turn out to be false, or at least to be not 100% accurate sometime in the future. But that's a good thing, because if this happens, if we discover that something that we thought was true is actually not true, that means that we further improved our understanding of the universe. Like any other science, astronomy changes constantly. New theories 
attempt to explain things we could not explain before, and the new instruments allow us to make more precise measurements. This goes all the way back to the beginning of astronomy. Ancient astronomers had a model of the universe with the Earth at the center. We can see it in this book here from 1550, and this model is called the geocentric model. But with more precise measurements, the predictions of this model failed. So this model predicted certain things, such as where each planet is going to be in the sky at any point in time. And at first the predictions were accurate, but after a while, first of all, the predictions became less and less accurate with time, and also we made more precise measurements using more precise instruments, and we discovered that this model doesn't really give 100% accurate predictions. Eventually, astronomers realized that the Sun is actually at the center. This is now the accepted theory because its predictions fit our observations. Now, is this the final theory? In this case, I would say probably yes, because with the theory that the Sun is at the center of the solar system, we can predict the positions of all the planets in the solar system with extremely accurate precision. So it's very unlikely that this theory is ever going to be replaced with something else. But there is one thing that we discovered later after we had this theory that assumes the Sun is at the center of the solar system. We discovered that the Sun is actually just one of numerous stars, and the universe has no center. So, the theory that the Sun is at the center of the universe proved to be incorrect, but the theory that the Sun is at the center of the solar system is correct. Now, you may think that in the 21st century, we already know everything we need to know about astronomy, but in fact, that is not the case. There are many unanswered questions, including what are dark matter and dark energy? What is at the center of a black hole? And does life exist on other planets? The main job of astronomers and astrophysicists is to answer such questions, but it may take decades or even centuries to answer some of them. Astronomy is different from most other sciences because astronomers can't do experiments in a lab. They can only observe astronomical objects that are located incredibly far away and they do this using instruments such as telescopes. As technology improves, these instruments get better and better and allow us to make observations in greater detail and in different ways. Here's an example. As you may know, light is a type of electromagnetic radiation that humans can see, and we're gonna talk more about that later. But there are other types of radiation, such as infrared, x-rays, and radio waves, which we cannot see, but can be detected by instruments. We can observe the sky not only with light telescopes, but also with radio telescopes that see things that we could not see using just visible light. We can even place telescopes in outer space. This allows us to observe without being obstructed by the Earth's atmosphere. Now, this might be a good time to plug in my own research. So one of my main field of scientific research is general relativity. This theory provides a precise description of the force of gravity 
and explains how space and time work and how they get combined into space-time. General relativity completely revolutionized astronomy. It introduced new celestial objects, such as black holes. By the way, this is not a real black hole. This is just a simulation of how a black hole would look like. But we do have photos of actual black holes that I'm going to show you later. General relativity also introduced new tools to probe the sky, such as gravitational lensing and gravitational waves. And it helped us understand the origin of our universe in the form of the Big Bang. And here you can see a timeline of the universe, starting from the Big Bang at the left, at essentially the beginning of time, and then advancing in time until we get to today, which is 13.8 billion years after the Big Bang, on the far right. I'll talk much more about all these things and my own research in Astronomy 1PO2 next term. Now, in astronomy, we often measure distances in a unit called a light year. This is the distance light travels during one year. Now, it's important to understand that even though it has the word year in it, a light year is not a unit of time. And to see why that is, remember that when you say, I'm five minutes away, you're actually saying how far away you are. Five minutes away is the average distance a human walks in five minutes, or maybe drives if you're in a car. So we see that even though you're specifying a duration of time, you're actually measuring a distance. Now, no human walks at exactly the same speed all the time, but light always travels at the same speed, the speed of light. That's one of the most important lessons of my field of research, the theory of relativity. Also, the speed of light is the fastest possible speed. So, light always moves the same distance at the same amount of time, and it gets there faster than anything else. So it makes sense to use light years as a unit of distance. So just to be clear, we use light years as a unit of distance because we know that in one year, light anywhere in the universe and any kind of light will always move the exact same distance. So that lets us define a precise distance that is constant and call it a light year. Now, the speed of light which, like I said before, is always the same, is approximately 300,000 kilometers per second, or if you prefer, 1 billion kilometers per hour. Now remember this basic formula, distance is speed multiplied by time. So to calculate how many kilometers are in a light year, we know the speed, we just need to know the time. So first we need to calculate how many seconds are in a year. Now in astronomy we use a Julian year, which is defined to be exactly 365.25 days long. Multiply that by 24 hours a day to get the total number of hours in a year, multiply it by 60 minutes per hour to get the total number of minutes in a year, and finally multiply that by 60 seconds per minute to get the number of seconds in a year, and you'll get approximately 31.6 million seconds. So, remember, distance is equal to speed multiplied by time, so the distance of one light year is equal to the speed of 300,000 kilometers per second times 
the time of 31,600,000 seconds. And that equals approximately nine and a half trillion kilometers. Now, just in case you're not sure what a trillion is, let me just review some common large numbers here. So a thousand is one followed by three zeros. A million is one followed by six zeros. A billion is one followed by nine zeros. A trillion is one followed by 12 zeros. And we also have larger numbers than that. We have quadrillion, which is one followed by 15 zeros. And quintillion, which is one followed by 18 zeros. And there are even larger numbers that I'm not going to mention right now. So nine and a half trillion kilometers means nine and a half times one followed by 12 zeros. This is a very long distance. If you drive a car at 120 kilometers per hour, it will take you about 9 million years to drive a distance of just one light year. Well, this is all the time we have for today. So we'll continue next time by talking more about astronomical distances. So welcome to our second lecture. Last time we ended by talking about some common large numbers and try to understand how long a light year is, basically. So now I want to give you some idea of astronomical distances. So one light year, like we saw, is a lot. It's nine and a half trillion kilometers. And if you drive a car at 120 kilometers per hour, it's gonna take you nine million years to drive just one light year. So that's already quite a lot. But actually, most of the astronomical distances of interest are much larger than one light year. So here's an example. The Orion Nebula is 1300 light years away from Earth. In kilometers, that's 12 and a half quadrillion kilometers away, which is this number over here with all these zeros. And if you're wondering what the nebula is, well, it is a cloud of gas and dust that new stars and planets are born from. Now, the speed of light is really fast, which means that it traverses short distances almost instantaneously. It seems like light travels at an infinite speed to us in our daily experience. Now, on astronomical scales, it can take light many years, even millions and billions of years to travel from place to place. Now, since the Orion Nebula is 1300 light years away, light from the Orion Nebula takes 1300 years to reach us, right? This is, what is a light year? It's the distance that light travels in one year. So to travel 1300 light years, light has to travel for 1300 years. So when we see the Orion Nebula in the sky, we actually see it as it was 1300 years ago, which was actually in the eighth century. We're not seeing it as it is today. And we'll only know how it looks like today when the light from the nebula reaches us, which is gonna be 1300 years from today. So as far as we know, maybe the entire nebula disappeared 500 years ago, but we won't know about it until we actually get the light from it in a few hundred years. 
This is, of course, uh, quite amazing, but it's actually also very useful because it means when you look up in the sky, it's kind of like having a time machine. And the farther away you look, the farther into the past you see. So this allows us to see how the universe looked like millions or billions of years in the past. If we can look far enough, which means if we have instruments that are precise enough, we can use that information to reconstruct the history and evolution of our universe. Okay, so when I look at uh, a galaxy that is one billion light years away, I see how that galaxy looked like one billion years ago. I don't have to do anything. This is just what I see because this is when the light was emitted that is now reaching me. Okay, so now that we understand a bit about cosmic distances, I want to take you on a brief tour of the universe. We we'll start, of course, with planet Earth, which is where we are right now. It is approximately spherical and has a diameter of around 13,000 kilometers. It is very special because not only is it where we are, it is also the only astronomical object that we know contains life, at least so far. We might discover life on some other planet or moon in a solar system, but that's not very likely. There may be life on other planets in other <laughs> solar systems, but for now, Earth is the only place we know that evolved life. Now, the moon is also special because it is the only celestial body that humans have visited in person as of 2022. Now, this is being recorded maybe like in 20 years, someone is watching this video, then we've already been to Mars by then. But right now, the moon is the only place that humans have visited in person. We've sent probes to other places, but not humans. The moon is approximately spherical and has a diameter of around 3,500 kilometers. It is located an average distance of 384 thousand kilometers from Earth, which seems far, but of course, if you compare that to a light year, which is nine and a half trillion kilometers, it's really nothing. So the moon is close, but it is actually far enough that light takes 1.3 seconds to travel that distance. And this caused a noticeable delay when astronauts communicated with Earth. The sun is a star, one of many stars. And a star is a huge ball of gas that generates energy and light by nuclear reactions. And of course we learn more about how that works later. The next closest star is Proxima Centauri, which is only 4.2 light years, which is about 40 trillion kilometers away. Now between us and this star, in these 40 trillion kilometers, there is nothing. There are no other stars. This is the closest star to us. Now, going back to the sun and the solar system, including the Earth, 
there are eight planets that revolve around the sun. These planets are Mercury, <coughs> Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. Now, one thing to note about this illustration is the sizes of the planets are actually to scale. So like this is how big Jupiter is compared to Earth. But uh, the distances, of course, are not to scale. Right? So there is a much, much larger distance between all these planets. But of course, there just isn't enough space on the screen to draw the actual distance. Now, planets and moons don't generate their own light, but they reflect the sun's light. So you can see here the sun generating a lot of light using these nuclear reactions. All these planets that you see, you only see them because they reflect the light of the sun. I mean, that's basically how you see most things. You see them because they reflect light. Now, galaxies are enormous collections of between 100 million to 100 trillion stars. Each one of these stars, like our sun, some bigger, some smaller, uh, in different places along their lifespan. But there's nothing really special about our sun between those stars, there is interstellar gas and dust, also known as the interstellar medium. So interstellar means inter is between, stellar is star, so between the stars. Now this, by the way, is, the, is called the phantom galaxy. And it's uh, one of the new photos released by the uh, James Webb Space Telescope. Uh, just last month. Now we are located in the Milky Way galaxy, which contains 100 to 400 billion stars, including our sun. This galaxy is about uh, between 100,000 and 200,000 light years wide and 1,000 light years thick. Now, it's important to understand since we're inside the Milky Way galaxy, we of course don't know how it looks like from the outside. You know, someone once asked me if, if we have pictures of the Milky Way. Of course, you have pictures of the Milky Way from inside the disk, which is what you see when you look up in the sky, but we don't have photos of the Milky Way from above the disk. It would take us a few million years just to get to a place where we can take such a photo. We think the Milky Way is a barred spiral galaxy, which means it might look something like this galaxy, which is called the uh, NGC 1073. So you can see that it is spiral. Maybe it's kind of hard to see in this uh, picture, but if you look carefully, you'll see that there are spirals. Here's one spiral, here's one, here's one, here's one. So there are these spirals. And also there is this long bar in the middle, just a straight, bar like this. So this is more or less how the Milky Way would look like if aliens were observing it like we are observing this galaxy. Now where exactly are we in this galaxy? So the Sun is between 25,000 and 29,000 light years from the center of the galaxy. It is located inside a spiral arm called the Orion Arm. Okay, so here is a sketch, of course not an actual photo, of the Milky Way galaxy. 
And you can see here the Orion arm, sometimes also called the Orion Cygnus arm. Uh, and again, you see these spirals. So each of these spirals has a name. The solar system over here inside this arm and this yellow, um, this yellow circle illustrates the orbit of the sun around the center of the galaxy. So the sun doesn't stay in place. The sun orbits the center of the galaxy just like the earth orbits the sun and the moon orbits the earth. It takes the sun between 220 and 250 million years to orbit the center of the galaxy. And it does that at around 230 kilometers per second. Now you may wonder why don't we feel this enormous speed? And I'll explain that um, in the coming weeks. By the way, any questions so far? Feel free to raise your hand if you have any questions. Yeah. Uh -huh. If we were to have, say, a telescope strong enough to look at another planet far out there, would that technically still be looking back in time? Yes. So even now, when you look at me, you're seeing me in the past, right? You're seeing me like one nanosecond in the past. So whenever you look at anything, you always see it in the past. It's just that when you look at stuff that is cosmic distances away, you see it in the far past, not just one nanosecond in the past, but possibly thousands or millions of years in the past. Yes. And that happens as like the light literally just can't travel to us fast enough. So even if we had like a telescope that could look that far out, the light just wouldn't hit it for like years. Exactly. So the telescope, all it does is it captures light that gets to it, but the light still has to get to it. So the light has to start here in some star or planet or galaxy, and then slowly travel, slow of course in cosmic terms, until finally it gets into your telescope, and that can be billions of years later. Um, yeah? So watching the light of the star, then it might have been destroyed already when you're watching it. Very good. So yeah, if, if you see a star right now, there's no guarantee that star actually exists. It could have been destroyed and you just haven't seen it yet. Yeah. So like if we looked at a planet, there could be life like now, but like we wouldn't see it because we're looking at the past. Right, so um, if we could detect life on a planet, which is hard to do from a file, but I guess you can detect, for example, certain um, chemical elements in the atmosphere and so on. So yeah, it's possible that we see a planet right now in some other solar system and we don't detect any life, but by the time we are seeing it, it has actually already detected life. It's just that we don't know it yet because we haven't seen the light from that period yet. Yes. Yes, I'll get to that in the, one of the next slides. Any other questions? Yeah? So even when we see like a meteor shower, that's already happened, or that's we're seeing it delayed, kind of? Well, uh, a meteor so shower happens in the Earth's atmosphere. So you're seeing it as it was like a few microseconds in the past. I mean, of course, it's still in the past, Whenever you see anything, it's always in the past, but usually not in a noticeable way. But when you look at the Earth, that's when things start to have a delay. Yeah? Um, does this also change the way that we perceive time as well? Like, do people experience time at like, different distances? Or do they perceive it differently at different distances? Um, not exactly, but people do perceive time differently uh, in different frames of reference. And I'm going to talk about that uh, when we talk about relativity a bit later.
All right, so at the center of our galaxy, there is a supermassive black hole called Sagittarius A star. A black hole is a region of space where gravity is so strong that nothing can escape that region, not even light, which is why it's black, because light from it cannot reach us. This black hole at the center of our galaxy, Sagittarius A star, has the mass of four million suns. And that's why it's called a supermassive black hole. Most galaxies have similar supermassive black holes at their centers. Now this image was taken by the Event Horizon Telescope. And you're probably wondering, first of all, why is it so blurry? And why is it orange? Because it's supposed to be black, right? Um, and you may be wondering how exactly we could get this image and so on. So if you are interested in that, I will talk about that when we uh, talk about black holes in astronomy 1P02. Any questions? Yeah? <laughs> Well, um, that, that's, that's a good question. So the, there is this misconception that a black hole sucks things into it. A black hole is just something that has mass, just like the sun or the earth. So it attracts things rotationally, but you can orbit it. So yeah, if you went directly into the black hole, you would be sucked in by it, just like if you went directly into the sun, you will be sucked by it. But uh, since we are actually, let me go back a bit. Since we are actually orbiting the center of the galaxy, we are just going to continue orbiting for the foreseeable future. We're never going to get sucked in at some point, the galaxy might be destroyed in some way, like collision with another galaxy or something. That's gonna take, it might be in billions or trillions of years in the future. So, you know, we're safe. We're not gonna get sucked into the black hole because black holes don't suck. You can, well, they definitely don't suck. Uh, you can uh, just orbit them like you can orbit any other massive body. Uh, yeah? Yeah, so here is the uh, galactic ball. This is the center of the galaxy. Inside here, somewhere, there is this supermassive black hole and we are orbiting it. I mean, we're not orbiting just the black hole. We are orbiting essentially the entire galaxy, um, but the black hole definitely is a very big part uh, in, of the mass of the galaxy. What would be the closest we would ever like actually get to being near the black hole? Like, well, so we are about at least 25,000 light years away from this black hole. So if let's say you wanted to visit it and let's say that you could travel very close to the speed of light, you could visit it but it's going to take you 25,000 years to get there. Now, there may be smaller black holes that are closer to us that we could potentially visit in a, a less ridiculous amount of time, um, but we haven't detected any yet. Do you know what happens to stuff or people that enter this black hole? Do you know what happens? Things that enter this black hole are going to be torn apart into their individual atoms and cease to exist, essentially. So you definitely don't want to do that. Uh, even if somehow you manage to stay alive, you won't be able to escape the black hole. Uh, you're just gonna be stuck in there forever. 
So I, I do not recommend it. <laughs> yes. Uh, so what happens to the galaxy if like uh, black hole deteriorates due to hot radiation? Well, the uh, so uh, black holes supposedly emit radiation called Hawking radiation. And we, again, we'll learn more about that uh, next term. And uh, they decrease in mass gradually because they lose mass by emitting this radiation. However, this radiation is extremely small. So it's gonna take trillions of years before this black hole gets smaller in an noticeable way. Okay, so let's uh, move on. Now in this image from the Hubble Space Telescope, you can see around 10,000 galaxies. So each dot, like this dot over here, and this tiny dot, and there's this tiny dot you can't even see, all of these are individual galaxies, and each one of these contains billions or trillions of stars. And we discover more galaxies all the time. So this image is a much more recent image than a previous one. This is an image from last month from the James Webb Space Telescope. And in this image, you can also see thousands of galaxies. And many of these galaxies are galaxies that we've never seen before last month. The reason we're seeing them now is that Hubble, the space telescope that took the previous image, wasn't uh, sensitive enough and also didn't look in the correct wavelength. Um, and this new telescope can see farther away than we've ever seen before. Of course, remember, seeing farther away also means seeing farther into the past, which is also one of the reasons uh, we built this space telescope. Now, you should understand that this entire image covers a patch of sky that is the size of a grain of sand held at arm's length. Okay, so you take the grain of sand, you hold it like this, and then out of the entire sky around you, not just above you, but also below you and everywhere around you, this is only the size of that grain of sand. So there is really a, a countless number of galaxies in the universe. Now, there are some small galaxies close to the Milky Way, but the nearest large galaxy is called Andromeda. It's two and a half million light years away, and it also has a few small satellite galaxies. The Milky Way, Andromeda, and at least eight smaller galaxies form this thing called the local group. Local group of galaxies. So here is the Milky Way. Here is Andromeda. These are the largest galaxies, but then there are also uh, smaller galaxies all around. This collection of galaxies, we call it the local group because it is local. This is where we are. This local group is 10 million light years in diameter. From here to here, it is 10 million light years. The local group is itself part of something bigger called the Virgo supercluster, which is 110 million light years in diameter. And it contains at least 100, not galaxies, but 100 galaxy groups and clusters. 
So here, this is kind of a schematic map. Here is the local group, but there are also all these other groups in different places around us that are millions of light years away. And all of these are included in this Virgo supercluster. So now uh, to answer a question that was asked here, does the Milky Way orbit anything? Then yes, the Milky Way uh, is part of this system of uh, galaxy clusters. Well, first of all, it's, it's part of this system of galaxies, and it, it's also part of this system of galaxies and galaxy clusters, and there is kind of a center of mass of this supercluster, and the Milky Way orbits that center of mass, just like the Sun orbits the center of the Milky Way, and the Earth orbits the Sun, and the Moon orbits the Earth. Uh, any questions so far? Yes. Um, do all stars have their own set of planets, like orbiting them? That's a good question. So uh, the question was, if all stars have planets orbiting them, most stars have planets orbiting them, uh, but it may be that there are some stars that for some reason never developed any planets during the development of their solar system. Yeah. How much um, do the other planets affect Earth? Like, does it influence us at all? Right, so the question is if other planets affect the Earth. So yeah, there are there is gravity between anything that has mass. So the other planets affect the orbit of the Earth because they pull it in different directions. Uh, we'll talk a bit more about that when we learn about orbits. Yeah. Uh -huh. Is it the center of its local group? Uh, it's not the center. So, so the question is whether the Milky Way is the center of the local group. You can see that, um, well, the Milky Way is at the center here because this is from our point of view. But, uh, I mean, this is just a matter of definition. Any point here could be the center. There is one point that you can calculate if you know the masses and positions of all the galaxies, which is called the center of mass, and you could call that the center of the local group uh, if you want to be more precise. But of course, whenever we look at something, it always looks to us like we are at the center. This is exactly why people thought that the Earth is at the center of the solar system, because that's just how it looks like if you're on Earth. Yeah? Um, in this supercluster, you said that like, the Milky Way orbits the center of mass. Is that like an actual object, or is it just like the different like, gravitational poles that hold it together? Uh, good question. So uh, the question is, does the Milky Way orbit, uh, when I say that the Milky Way orbits the center of mass, is it an actual object that is being orbited around? So no, the center of mass is just an imaginary point, which is kind of like the average of all the masses. Um, we'll talk more about that when we learn about gravity, but usually there is no actual object at that center. It's just uh, something you can calculate. Um, okay, so let's move on. Now the Virgo supercluster, you can see that this just keeps going. So the Virgo supercluster in turn is part of the Laniakea supercluster. It contains more than 100,000 galaxies and has a diameter of 520 million light years. Okay, so this is here the local group, and in this area is the Virgo supercluster, but there are all these other clusters and groups over here, and all of these uh, are part of this one thing that is called the Laniakea supercluster. 
the most distant known galaxy as of today, this might change tomorrow, but right now the most distant galaxy we know of is called GNZ11 and is located 32 billion light years away. It's obviously very, very far away, so you can't really get a high resolution photo of it. Now, around 13.8 billion years ago, at what we call the Big Bang, which is kind of an unfortunate term, uh, the universe began to expand from a hot and dense state. As it expanded, it became colder and less dense. And eventually, it was cold and less dense enough that stars and planets could be formed. And you can see here, basically the whole history of the universe as we understand it today, with the Big Bang here, and then you can see space expanding. And you can see that here there are no stars. The first stars appear only after about 180 million years. And this keeps going until we get to now. Now, despite its name, the Big Bang wasn't an explosion. It was simply the time when the expansion of the universe started. So the universe has been expanding ever since that point in time, and it might keep expanding forever, although, of course, we are not 100% sure about that. Uh, the universe isn't expanding into anything. Instead, distances become longer. So it, it, it's kind of hard to imagine, but this, this photo is actually a bit misleading because it shows as if something is actually expanding inside some ambient space, right? This, it looks like there's this outside space and then the universe just expands within that space, but that's not really how it works. The way it works is the distances just become longer. So like the distance from me to you right now is let's say 20 meters, but then a million years from now, that same distance will be 40 meters. So we haven't expanded into anything, it's just, di just the distances became longer. This analogy isn't perfect because actually this distance is not going to expand because there is gravitational and electromagnetic pull between the atoms of the stars, and that actually prevents the distance from expanding. But when you have long stretches of empty space between galaxies, there's nothing to stop this expansion. Uh, yes? If the universe is always expanding, does that mean that there's some point at end? So the question is, uh, if the universe is always expanding, does that mean that there is an end to the universe? So um, that's a bit hard to answer right now. The short answer is we don't know. The universe might be infinite, which means there is no end, or it might be finite, but if it is finite, then it still would have no end. It's just that you go in this direction, and then after you pass through the entire universe, you actually go back to the same place you came from. Yeah? With it continuing to expand and becoming colder, could this potentially go from being a good thing to a bad thing down the line? Or is that something that, that you, there's no worry for that? Right, so uh, good question. So the question is, uh, the universe keeps expanding and it becomes colder and colder. Can that turn into a bad thing? So yeah, definitely. Uh, something that could happen, uh, which is called the heat death of the universe is essentially that the universe becomes so cold that nothing can uh, happen in it anymore. There's not gonna be any stars, there's not gonna be any life, uh, there's not gonna be any way to really do anything. Uh, that, however, is unimaginably far in the future. You have another question?
The universe's expansion is accelerating. Uh, we'll learn why later, although probably only next term in 1P02. Uh, any more questions? Yeah? Um, well, atoms can be created and destroyed. So, um, so the question is, is there a finite amount of atoms? And the answer is, if the universe is finite in size, then probably yes. But if it's infinite, then that means there's an infinite amount of atoms in it. Yeah? Could there be a second universe? Well, there are lots of different hypotheses uh, that hypothesize that there are different universes of different kinds. Um, I also have a hypothesis like that, actually. Uh, I can read about it in my papers, but uh, remember what I said last time, my hypothesis is just an idea that hasn't uh, been verified experimentally. So. Right now, the only thing we know is that there is one universe, and that's all we know. Yeah? If the universe keeps on expanding, does that mean galaxies and clusters will eventually move apart from each other? Yeah, so when the universe expands, galaxies and galaxy clusters are always moving away from each other because the distances between them increase. So um, eventually, they're going to be so far away from each other that if you look out, you're not going to even see any light coming into where you are because th things are just going to be so incredibly far away. Um, yes? How are galaxies created? Sorry? How are galaxies created? How are galaxies created? That's a great question, but uh, it has a long answer. So you'll have to wait until next term when we learn about galaxy creation. It almost like galaxies, like forming. Like, you know how they like come together and then break apart into smaller kind of atoms? Would that kind of be like forming new galaxies, but like insanely large as Um Not exactly. Like I said, it's, it's a bit complicated, so uh, if you continue to Astronomy 1PO2, we'll talk about it in, uh, in depth. Uh, okay, yeah? So um, the question is, if there's gravitational pull, how is the universe expanding? So like I said, let's say, between you and me, there is sufficient gravitational pull that it can cancel the expansion of the universe as long as that expansion doesn't exert a stronger pull in the other direction. So right now, um, you only have expansion between galaxies, but if the expansion keeps accelerating, Eventually, it could even tear apart galaxies themselves, make stars uh, expand away from each other, and then maybe even in the very, very, very far future, start making atoms expand far away from each other. All right, let's move on. So um, there are plenty of misconceptions about the Big Bang and the expansion of the universe, and we are going to discuss them in Astronomy 1PO2. So I know you have lots of questions about it, and they're all great questions, but uh, this is gonna be like two or three lectures just devoted to that, so you know, you have to be patient. So the oldest thing we can see in the universe is called the cosmic microwave background. What it is, is electromagnetic radiation that was emitted only 
380,000 years after the Big Bang, which is not a lot of time on cosmic scales. The reason it was emitted, um, again, it, it's gonna take a bit of time to explain this in detail, but essentially before that time, the universe was so dense and so hot that it was completely opaque. So light couldn't actually travel from one place to another. And then 380,000 years after the Big Bang, the universe started becoming transparent and light could start travel. And this is the first light in the universe, essentially. Now, everything I talked about so far in the last two lectures is part of the observable universe. Observable meaning the part we can see from Earth. So what we can observe. The observable universe is a sphere with a diameter of 93 billion light years, which means the edge of that sphere is 46 and a half billion light years away from us. Okay, so here uh, we are in the Virgo supercluster and we're right in the middle. And here we have 46 and a half billion light years until we get to the edge of the sphere. Now, it's important to understand the reason we can't see anything beyond the edge of the observable universe isn't that there is something in the way, like an actual barrier or edge, or that our telescopes aren't good enough to see beyond it. It's because, as I said before, light takes time to travel. So objects that are outside the observable universe are so far away that the light from them just has not had time to reach us yet. In fact, it's never going to reach us because the universe keeps expanding. So the edge of the observable universe is an imaginary line beyond which light cannot get to us. But there isn't any actual edge to the universe. Imagine aliens living far away in some different galaxy, let's say a billion light years away. They will see a different observable universe and then the edge of their observable universe is gonna be at a different place. Still at the same radius of 46 and a half billion light years but a different place than the edge of our observable universe. And again, this is because of the travel time of light. There are uh, galaxies that, uh, from which light has had time to reach us, so they are within our observable universe, but they haven't yet had time to reach the aliens in this other galaxy, so they are not in the aliens observable universe. And the aliens will also see them at the center of the sphere. So the sphere isn't an actual sphere. It's just an imaginary sphere that we are at the center because, like I said before, when you look around, it looks to you like you are at the center of things. Doesn't mean you're actually at the center. It's only just your point of view. The size of the whole universe, including the parts that are not observable, but don't get confused. If they're not observable, doesn't mean they don't exist. It just means that we haven't seen the light from them yet. Um, so the size of the whole universe is unknown. It could potentially be infinite, or uh, like I mentioned before, uh, it could be of finite size, but cyclic, so you actually you go that way and then you find yourself back in the same point you started from. Now, uh, to answer a question that was asked, so the universe is 13.8 billion 
years old, and the edge of the observable universe is 46 and a half billion light years away. So if light travels at the rate of one light year per year, by definition, then light could only have traveled 13.8 billion light years since the Big Bang. So how can this be? Well, the reason is that the universe is expanding. The galaxies that are currently at the edge of the observable universe, or maybe I should say it of our observable universe, used to be much closer to us, but the distance to those galaxies expanded with time. So the distance expanding, meaning light has traveled more distance to get to us. Yes? That's a good question. So the question is, is the universe expanding faster than the speed of light? And the answer is that essentially the expansion of the universe doesn't have a speed. What happens is that things, so distances are becoming longer. And if you look at something that is far enough away from us, it looks like it is moving away from us faster than light. In fact, that is why it's outside the observable universe, because it's moving faster than light from it can reach us. Uh, but this doesn't violate relativity, which says that nothing can travel faster than light, um, because nothing is actually moving faster than light. It's just the distances become larger, so it looks like it's moving faster than light. Okay, 10 to the n is a power of 10. So if you, have, if you see something that looks like 10 and then an exponent n, where n is a positive integer, that means, very simple, one followed by n zeros. So a thousand is 10 to the three, okay, so n equals three. So it's one followed by three zeros. A million, 10 to the six, is one followed by six zeros. A billion, 10 to the nine, one followed by nine zeros, and so on. So all these numbers we learned about last time are uh, just one with some number of zeros after it. Now, if you multiply two powers of 10, let's say you have 10 to the n, and you multiply that by 10 to the m, the result is 10 to the sum of n plus m. For example, 10 to the three times 10 to the nine, three plus nine is 12, so the answer is 10 to the 12. Now, if you translate it to words, then 10 to the three is a thousand, 10 to the nine is a billion, and 10 to the 12 is a trillion, and indeed, a thousand times a billion is equal to a trillion. And why are we learning about this? Because we want to learn scientific notation. And scientific notation is the notation we use to write very large numbers. And of course, as we've seen in astronomy, we deal with very large numbers in terms of distances and time and so on. So we need to have some compact and well-defined way to write these large numbers. So a scientific notation is just a number times the power of 10. For example, 2.3 times 10 to the six is scientific notation. What does it stand for? Well, 10 to the six is one with six zeros, 2.3 times one with six zeros, which is one million, is two million three hundred thousand. You can do this on your calculator. You don't have to do this in your head. Okay. Another example, 4.7 times 10 to the 12. So again, it's 4.7 times one with 12 zeros after it, which is a trillion. 
and that comes down to 4 trillion, 700 billion. Again, you can do this easily in your calculator. But you just need to understand what this, this notation stands for. It stands for this, it's just a short way to write this number. Now, if I want to multiply two numbers in scientific notation, essentially it goes this way. So I have one number times the second number. The first number is a times 10 to the n. Second number is b times 10 to the m. And the product is a times b times 10 to the power of n plus m. So you multiply the two coefficients and you add the two exponents. And here is a simple example, one and a half times 10 to the three times three times 10 to the six. So one and a half times three is four and a half. Three plus six is nine. So the answer is four and a half times 10 to the nine. Again, you don't need to do this in your head. You can do this in a calculator, uh, but you should understand really just what these numbers stand for. So, a quiz. What is 2 times 10 to the 9 times 4 times 10 to the 6? Okay, who, who thinks it's A? Who thinks it's B? Raise your hand. Okay. Who thinks it's C? Okay, so... <laughs> Okay, so the people who said B are correct because two, <laughs> yeah, great, great job. So two times four is eight, nine plus six is 15. So it's eight times 10 to the 15. Okay, so let's uh, finish here and we'll continue on Wednesday. So now I want to calculate uh, the size of the observable universe. Remember the observable universe is the part of the universe we can see from Earth and stuff outside the observable universe we just can't see because the light can't get to us due to the expansion of the universe. Essentially, it's expanding faster than light is traveling. So, um, I told you last time, the size of the observable universe is 93 billion light years, which is 93 times 10 to the nine light years. LY means light years. So a billion is one followed by nine zeros, so that's 10 to the 9. Um, also, last time we calculated that one light year is 9.5 trillion kilometers. And again, in scientific notation, 9.5 times 10 to the 12 kilometers, because trillion is one followed by 12 zeros, and that is 10 to the 12. Okay, so the quiz now is who can calculate the size of the observable universe in kilometers? Yes. It's 883.5 times 10 to the 21 kilometers. Okay, good. So um, we multiply these two numbers. So 93 times nine and a half is this. 10 to the 9 times 10 to the 12, that's just 9 plus 12, that's 21. Now, all of this is just an approximation, right? I mean, we don't know the size down to a centimeter, so uh, we might as well round it up. So this is 883 and a half, we can just round it up to 1,000, which is 10 to the 3. So we actually have 10 to the 3 times 10 to the 21, Again, multiplying two powers of 10, I just add the powers. So three plus 21 is 24. 
the size of the observable universe is approximately 10 to the 24 kilometers, which is 1000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000
we begin to see the great flat spiral of our galaxy, a few hundred billion stars rotating around a black hole, Sagittarius A star, 4.2 million times more massive than our Sun. We now think supermassive black holes reside at the centre of nearly all galaxies. These two dwarf galaxies are the Magellanic Clouds, which together with at least 80 others make up what's known as the local group of galaxies. 10 to the 22, 1 million light years. Soon we'll pass the supergiant elliptical galaxy M87. And if we switch to radio waves, we can glimpse the supermassive black hole at its centre. Switching back to visible light as we traverse the Virgo supercluster, each tiny dot, not a star, but a galaxy. Billions of stars floating in an ever-growing void. 10 to the 24 metres, the limits of our vision in 1977. But over 40 years later, we can show a bit more. Clusters of galaxies arranged along filaments, like the Pisces Cetus Supercluster Complex. At 10 to the 26 metres, we switch our view to microwave. And we can now see the current limit of our vision. This light forms a sort of wall all around us. The light and dark patches show differences in temperature by fractions of a degree, revealing where matter was beginning to clump together to form the first galaxies shortly after the Big Bang. This light is known as the cosmic microwave background radiation. 10 to the 27 meters, one followed by 27 zeros. Beyond this point, the nature of the universe is truly uncharted and debated. This light was emitted around 380,000 years after the Big Bang. Before this time, the universe was so hot that it was not transparent to light. Is there simply more universe out there yet to be revealed? Or is this region still expanding, generating more universe, or even other universes with different physical properties to our own? How will our understanding of the universe have changed by 2077? How many more powers of 10 are out there? From a picnic blanket on Sicily to the very edge of our understanding, I salute the Eames for the way they told this beautiful story, the story of the universe. Right, so uh, one thing I should mention he was talking about meters, and I was talking about kilometers. So there is a bit of a discrepancy between the numbers. When I say here that the observable universe is 10 to the 24 kilometers, each kilometer is 1,000 meters. So that's 10 to the 27 meters, and that was the highest scale in the movie. Uh, this movie is basically a remake of a movie from 1977, as he said, and you can find that original movie on YouTube. Obviously, it's not as high quality and not as up to date, uh, but it's still a very nice illustration of the scales of the universe we live in. So, we talked about the biggest things in the universe, right? We zoomed out, basically starting from human scales, and then increasing to planets, stars, galaxy, galaxy clusters, and the cosmic microwave background, and the whole observable universe. Now let's instead zoom in and check out the smallest things in the universe. So, of course, to do that, we need to do more math. We talked about positive powers of 10. There are also negative powers of 10. So those are numbers that look like this, 10 to the minus n, where n is some positive integer. And what it means is really simple. It's just 1 divided by 10 to the n. So 1 divided by 1 followed by n zeros. You can also write 10 to the minus n as n zeros followed by a one with a decimal place after the first zero. So it's basically kind of like an inverted 10 to the n. So instead of one followed by n zeros, it's n zeros followed by a one. Here are some examples. So one thousandth 
is 10 to the minus 3. So that's 1 over 10 to the 3, or 1 over 1,000. And you can also write it as 0 0.001. So notice those three zeros followed by a 1, and a decimal point after the first zero. 1 millionth is 10 to the minus 6. So that is 1 over 10 to the 6, which is 1 followed by 6 zeros, which is a million. So it's 1 over a million. You can also write it as a decimal. So now it's 6 zeros followed by a 1. And 1 billionth is 10 to the minus 9. So that's 1 over 10 to the 9. So 1 over 1 with 9 zeros after it or 1 over a billion, or you can write it as nine zeros followed by a one with a decimal place over here. And these are just three examples. Obviously, you can do it with any number uh, on the exponential. So as you can see, these numbers, as I increase the exponential, the numbers become smaller and smaller. You need more and more a digit after the decimal point to specify that number. So, most things we can see or detect, like stars, planets, and humans, are made of atoms. Every atom is composed of a nucleus surrounded by a cloud of electrons. So here you can see, this is the nucleus here in the middle, it's very small, and here there's this fuzzy cloud of electrons. Now the nucleus itself is made of protons and neutrons, each of which is around 100,000 times smaller than an atom. And here you can see we zoomed into the nucleus, and we see here these protons and neutrons, so this is a helium atom. A helium atom has two protons and two neutrons. So you can see here uh, the blue are the protons and the red are the neutrons. Or the other way around, I guess, it doesn't matter. Um, you can also see here the scales. So the scale of the entire atom is 10 to the minus 10 meters. So that's 1 divided by 10 to the 10, or 0 0.00000000001 meters. And then the scale of the nucleus is 100,000 times smaller. Uh, 100,000 is 10 to the 5. So we get from 10 to the minus 10 down to the 10 to the minus 15. So, um, let's talk about atomic scales. So like I said, the size of an atom is 10 to the minus 10 meters. So it is a very, very small number, 0.0000001 meters. The size of a nucleus is 10 to the minus 15 meters, which is even smaller. So now it's 15 zeros and a one in the end. The size of a proton or a neutron, these are the particles that make up the nucleus, just a bit smaller than the nucleus. Now this illustration of an atom you may have seen before is actually wrong, because here what you see is that you have, uh, well, the nucleus with protons and neutrons inside it, and then there are electrons that orbit in these well-defined orbits, like planets orbit a star. But that's not how it actually works. This is how people thought it actually worked 100 years ago. But nowadays we know the electrons don't really orbit the nucleus, as this illustration suggests. Uh, they're just probability clouds like I showed you uh, in the slide before, 
is just kind of like a fuzzy cloud of electrons. And I'll explain what that means when we learn about quantum mechanics in a few lectures. Why, why are we taught like that it's like that then? Like that it goes around in like an orbit? Well, you're taught a lot of incorrect things. So my job is to correct them. You know, this is kind of like a nice picture, a nice illustration that doesn't require you to understand quantum mechanics. So when you teach it in uh, high school uh, and you don't understand quantum mechanics at that point, then I guess this is the best they can do, but I'm going to teach you some more advanced picture of an atom, which is the correct picture as far as we know. Uh, another question here. Um, how recent, how recent, how much like recently did we learn that this was not the case? Like how recent did we say, oh, okay, it's not orbits, like it's a probability cloud? So uh, quantum mechanics was developed in the 1920s and in the 1920s and 30s, that's when we started realizing this picture of the atom that we had before uh, was not correct. So schools are just still keeping with that then? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, like I said, quantum mechanics isn't a trivial thing to learn. I guess they don't teach it in high schools. Maybe they will in the future, but... Okay, so, you know, some people have learned about it. So now there are 118 different types of atoms that we know of, which are also called chemical elements. Of course, I said that we know of. Maybe later we'll discover more, but this is what we know right now. So all atomic matter in the universe is made of different combinations of these 118 elements. And notice as I said atomic matter, there is also non-atomic matter. We'll talk about that later. The number of protons so remember, the nucleus has protons and neutrons. The number of protons is also known as the atomic number, and it determines the type of the chemical element. So for example, hydrogen has one proton, helium has two protons, and so on. Anything that has one proton and any number of neutrons is an hydrogen atom. And of course, all of you are familiar with the periodic table of elements. Uh, you don't need to know any of this. This is just to illustrate that these are all the different types of atoms that we uh, know of. And you can, in fact, organize them in a well-defined way according to some properties that I'm not going to get into. But you can see here, for example, hydrogen is the first one with one proton. So its atomic number is one. And then here we have helium with two protons, and lithium with three protons, beryllium with four protons, and so on, increasing until we get to the last one, 118 protons. Now, what's interesting is that hydrogen, that has just one proton, is the most common element, and it makes up 74% of all atomic matter. And then helium, which has two protons, makes up 24% of atomic matter. Now, if you add this up, you'll get 98% is either hydrogen or helium. So the other 116 elements make up the remaining 2%. So basically the entire universe is mostly either hydrogen or helium. And it makes sense because these have the smallest number of protons 
then in some sense they are the easiest to make. Now, of course, some matter is made of molecules, which are groups of two or more atoms bonded together. And here we have a water molecule, and you can see it has one oxygen atom connected to two hydrogen atom, and together they make up one water molecule, and water is made out of these molecules, not individual atoms. Now we get to elementary particles. So the protons and neutrons in the nucleus are not elementary. They are made of even smaller particles that are called up and down quarks. So in a proton, we have two up quarks and one down quark. So you can see here up, up, and down. And you can see how they're all kind of connected together. Kind of like atoms are connected in a molecule, except it's, it's a very different type of connection, governed by a different type of force. And here we have a neutron, which is one up quark and two down quark. Uh, you can see here one up and then down and down. And again, they're all connected together. Now you may ask why they're called up and down. It's just, just some name someone invented. It doesn't have any actual meaning. So let's summarize. All atomic matter in the universe is actually made of just three kinds of particles, electrons, up quarks, and down quarks. An atom, we said, is made of a nucleus surrounded by a cloud of electrons. And the nucleus itself is made of protons and neutrons, and the protons and neutrons are made of quarks, up and down quarks, to be specific. So that if we go all the way down to the most elementary particles we know of, there are only three of them. Electrons, up quarks, and down quarks make up all the atoms. As far as we know, electrons and quarks are not made of any smaller particles, which is why we call them elementary particles. Again, I keep saying in this course, if I don't say as far as we know, then just imagine I said as far as we know, because everything is just as far as we know. 50 years ago, uh, we didn't know about quarks, but now we know about them. There is uh, another common elementary particle called the photon. That is the particle of light and electromagnetic radiation. And we will learn more about it later. There are other more exotic elementary particles like uh, Higgs bosons and gluons and uh, W and Z bosons and uh, top and bottom quarks and all kinds of uh, other exotic particles that we're not going to learn about right now, but they also exist. So now, Let's talk about scales, because that's really why we're here. So the sizes of the elementary particles, they're actually unknown and hard to define. And the reason for that is quantum mechanics. Because in quantum mechanics, small things are fuzzy, so you can't exactly define where they start and where they end. So you, you can't really define the size of these very small elementary particles. In fact, mathematically, when physicists talk about these particles and do calculations with them and, and write theories that involve them, we treat these particles as just points that have no size. But experimentally speaking, we have some upper bound on the sizes of quarks and electrons. So we know that quarks have to be less than 10 to the minus 19 meters. 
which is this number, which is very, very small. And we know that the electrons have to be smaller than 10 to the minus 22 meters, which is, again, 22 zeros followed by one. And this does mean that this is the size of an electron. It could be much, much smaller than this, or like I said, it could be just of size zero with no actual size. It also depends how you actually define that size, but I'm not gonna get into that. So, now we know the smallest and largest scales in the universe. The smallest thing that we learned about, at least, is an electron, which is less than 10 to the minus 22 meters. The largest thing that we know of is the observable universe, which is 10 to the 24 kilometers. So, okay, here I used meters and here I used kilometers just because there's kind of this convention that in astronomical distances you use kilometers and then for subatomic distances you use meters. So I can convert this 10 to the minus 24 kilometers to 10 to 27 meters. So what is the difference between the smallest thing and the largest thing? It is 49 orders of magnitude. Right, so starting from 10 to the minus 22 with the size of a single electron, I have to keep multiplying by 10 49 times, essentially adding 49 zeros to the size until I get to the observable universe. So in other words, an electron is at least this much, 10 to the 49 times smaller than the observable universe. And this is a good point to remind you what I said last time, which is that the observable universe isn't the entire universe. It's just the part that we can see but just because we can't see something doesn't mean it doesn't exist. So, you know, aliens in some other galaxy are going to see a different region of the universe as their observable universe. So what is the entire universe, including the non-observable parts? Uh, it could be infinite. And if it's infinite, then obviously it is infinitely larger than a single electron or anything else for that matter. So you can treat this as just the lower bound. This is just the smallest ratio between an electron and the universe. It may be much larger than this or even infinite. Okay, so where do we fit into all of these scales? So humans, we are around the middle, right? So we have 10 to the minus 22 at the bottom and then 10 to the 27 at the top. So 10 to the zero is kind of like somewhere in the middle. It's 27 orders of magnitude smaller than the observable universe. So we are basically completely negligible compared to the whole universe and uh, 22 orders of magnitude larger than an electron. Of course, an electron is negligible compared to us. The farthest from Earth that humans have been is the moon. The moon is around 380,000 kilometers or 3.8 times 10 to the 8 meters away. Now, if you do the math, this is like moving one atom away if the observable universe was the size of the Earth. Okay, so imagine I shrink the whole observable universe to the size of the Earth, and then where have humans been able to travel from this atom to this atom? Just an infinitesimal distance within the entire universe. So we have a long way to go. But where can we go? 
So we have sent probes to other places in the solar system, and I'm going to talk about these probes in more details later. So uh, we sent probes to other planets, moons, asteroids, uh, but we haven't sent humans to any of these places. The only place we sent humans to is the moon. And these missions to the moon, they took on average three or four days. We want to send humans to Mars. This is everyone's big dream right now, uh, because Mars is kind of the most like Earth among the planets. Um, such a journey, depending on how fast your rocket can, can move you, will take several months, which is still doable. Now, what about the closest star? Proxima Centauri is 4.2 light years or 4 times 10 to the 13 kilometers away. So that's uh, 40 trillion kilometers. The fastest human made spaceship right now is NASA's Parker Solar Probe, which is expected to reach a maximum speed of 690 thousand kilometers per hour. This seems like a lot. Certainly it's a lot faster than any car or even plane can reach, but it's still just 0.06% of the speed of light. So it's completely negligible compared to the speed of light, which is the maximum speed things can move. So, traveling to Proxima Centauri at this speed, the fastest speed that humans have been able to reach so far, will take 6,500 years. Now, maybe this is possible. I mean, we could maybe travel, find a way to travel faster than this speed, uh, although not faster than the speed of light. Or maybe we could send humans inside, you know, like cryo chambers, or find some other way to make humans survive this journey. You can just make humans immortal if you want in the far future. And then maybe this journey is going to be possible. So now let's uh, talk about the nearest galaxy. The Andromeda Galaxy is located two and a half million light years away at the same speed of 690,000 kilometers per hour. Again, the fastest speed that humans have been able to accelerate a spaceship to. It would take four billion years to reach the Andromeda Galaxy. Even if we could travel close to the speed of light, which is physically possible, but extremely hard to do and definitely impossible to do with any technology we can imagine right now, um, it will still take at least two and a half million years to travel to Andromeda because the distance is two and a half million light years even if you can travel almost as fast as light. And I should mention that you can never travel as fast as light, but you can travel very, very close, like 99.99999% of the speed of light. That is physically possible to achieve, although very hard. Uh, but even if you can achieve that speed, because the distance is 2.5 million light years away, it takes light 2.5 million years to get there. And you cannot travel faster than light, so it's going to take you at least 2.5 million years to get there. There's just no way around it. You can never get there in any time less than 2.5 million years.
So the conclusion is that as far as we know right now, and again, everything I say might change later, uh, humans will never be able to travel to Andromeda with any conceivable technology. Basically, the only way they could travel to Andromeda is if they are just made immortal and they could live billions of years, or you can somehow uh, put them in some kind of stasis for two and a half million years while still having enough energy to sustain the trip for two and a half million years. So, you know, it's, it's kind of like science fiction territory. And Andromeda is the closest galaxy to us. So we're talking about just getting to the closest galaxy. The edge of the observable universe is 46 and a half billion light years away. So even if you could somehow imagine traveling for two and a half million years to Andromeda, it will take you 46 and a half billion years, which is much larger than the age of the universe to get to the edge of the observable universe. So as far as we know right now, based on what we know about technology and human lifespans, we are stuck forever in the Milky Way galaxy. It's actually interesting that most science fiction only happens within the Milky Way galaxy. There is very, very few science fiction stories where people actually go to other galaxies because it's just so far away that even with science fiction, it's just really hard to imagine ever getting to even the nearest galaxy, not to mention a farther away galaxy. Okay, so we talked about distance scales so far. Um, let's now talk about time scales. So the universe, as I said several times, is 13.8 billion years old, as far as we know. And modern humans evolved around 300,000 years ago. So it's really hard to define when humans actually started because it's kind of a very gradual process. But let's just put, put it at 300,000 years ago. So this is around, even though it looks very long and definitely it's extremely long in human time scales, right? It's literally the entire time that the entire modern human species has existed is still 20,000 times shorter than the age of the universe. Now, the recorded history of humanity only began around 5,000 years ago. We don't really have any records from earlier than that. So, uh, the recorded history of humanity is roughly three million times shorter than the age of the universe. Okay, now we calculated last time that there are 31.6 million seconds in a year. Now imagine that the universe only existed for one year. So I took these 13.8 billion years and I just compressed them all into one year then humans have only existed for the last 25 minutes of that year. And all recorded history has only existed for the last 10 seconds of that year. In other words, if the Big Bang took place at midnight on January 1st, then humanity only appeared on December 31st, the last day of the year, at 11.35 p.m. And recorded history only started at 
59 p.m. and 50 seconds. So 10 seconds before the year is over, that is when we started learning how to write. So, in conclusion, I hope this lecture made you interested in learning about astronomy and the universe. I definitely, it sounded like people had um, very uh, interesting questions. And I tried to give you an idea of just how immense and astonishing the universe is in terms of distance and time scales. In terms of reading, there is this textbook called OpenStax Astronomy. You can find a link on the course website. Um, if you want, you can read chapter one and appendices A to D, and that will uh, give you some more insight into what I talked about. However, I also talked about a lot of stuff that is not in the textbook, and also omitted some stuff that is in the textbook. So uh, let me stress that the lectures are the main source of material for this course. The uh, exams are going to be based on the lectures. And the textbook is for those who want to read more and uh, enhance their understanding. For further exploration, see the end of chapter one, and you'll see there is this Fauta Exploration chapter there um, that recommends books, websites, and videos. And I recommend, if you really want to learn more about all the stuff I just talked about over the last three lectures, uh, you should definitely read some of these extra materials. In terms of exercises, I am going to post practice questions on Teams. There was a question over there. Would the things in the further exploration be in the exams, or is that just for our own interest? So, like I said, the exams are based on the lectures. If you want to learn more about all this stuff, because there's a limited number of things I can talk about during a one and a half hour lecture, uh, there is the textbook. And if you want to know even more, there is this Fauta exploration.